Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, What Makes Education Catholic? It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Thomas Groom is a senior professor of theology and religious education here at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. He is the former director of BC's Church in the 21st Century, and for many years before that, directed the, uh, has directed the university's PhD in theology and education, still does so. Professor Groom was born and grew up, this might surprise you, in <laughs> County Kildare, Ireland. I'm gonna come back to his Irish heritage in a, shortly. He holds an MA in religious education from Fordham University and a doctorate in theology and education from Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary in New York. For many years, he was the senior faculty person and then director of Boston College's world-renowned Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry, which is now a department within the School of Theology and Ministry, which he served as the chair for several years before being relieved of those duties and no longer punished for his sins. <laughs> Professor Groom is an award-winning author, having written or edited some 10 books, over 200 essays, two grade school religion curricula, and he's the principal creator of the Credo series, which is a high school theology curriculum published by Veritas Benziger. There's more to say. In addition to a number of essay collections, his best known major books are Christian Religious Education, Sharing Faith, Educating for Life, What Makes Us Catholic, Will There Be Faith, and Faith for the Heart. A world-renowned scholar of religious education and a dynamic teacher, he has lectured widely throughout the United States and the world He's appeared on many local and national TV channels and radio programs and is frequently quoted in the press. Professor Groom has received many awards, including the Master Teacher of the Year from Boston College's School of Arts and Sciences. He describes his lifelong work as encouraging people to, quote, bring their lives to faith and their faith to life, end quote. Over more, for over more than 40 years, Professor Groom has directed more than 40 PhD dissertations and innumerable MA theses. Now I have to say, um, before I hand the ball over here, uh, there's a practice, the privilege I have is, as a dean to um, invite the speaker and significant other to dinner after this after the presentation I, so I invited uh, Tom and Colleen and Colleen responded by saying that not able to do it because Professor Groom has an invitation he has to fly down to Washington because he'll be at the White House tomorrow for St. Patrick's Day celebration <laughs> that's called getting a better offer <laughs> I know when I've been up staged. Um, but we are so thrilled that Tom is here to, to discuss his most recent book, What Makes Education Catholic? Spiritual Foundations. A wonderful colleague and scholar, and I also would say, privileged to say friend, I ask us to welcome warmly Professor Thomas Groom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. And without any Irish blarney, he's the best dean we've ever had in our school. And his, his, uh, his great courage as he fights for good health and uh, demands our prayers, which we're terribly, 
terribly happy to offer for him. And please, God, there'll be a good miracle, and uh, Tom will have a long life of good health. So, Tom, we're so proud of you and so grateful for you, and thank you so much for your very generous introduction. Um, I said it to my friend Richard Lenan before I came over, you know, I'm a kind of nervous. Uh, that's unusual for me, actually. I love a crowd, I love a, a gathering, an opportunity to speak. I mean, microphones are my favorite thing in the whole world, really. <laughs> but then I thought it was a home crowd, you know, that my old friends will be there and they'll be saying, oh, Tom, you know, you're not, you're losing it a little or maybe, you know, got lost a bit or, uh, but anyhow, I'm happy to be here and delighted that you could join us. And uh, I'm very, very excited about this topic. And uh, I'm also hoping to bring a copy of Tom's book and my book to the president and Mrs. Biden, Mrs. Biden tomorrow at the White House. So what makes education Catholic? I think, and by the way, my, my overheads are boringly, terribly boring and obvious and uncreative, but they keep me on track. And I also thought we have about four, 300, 400 people logging in um, uh, by Zoom. So I thought rather than just me being the talking head, if they could read it and see it and hear it, it might help, it might help for, for, for focus or something. But as I said, I, I've got to go get help with my PowerPoint. Um, it's a great question, I think. It's a new question. So uh, when you stop and think about it, what's going to happen after COVID? And please God, there will be an after COVID that it won't go on forever. But obviously it has had a huge impact. And it's just one of the, uh, one of the features of our contemporary reality that indeed uh, it's, it's going to be a different day. Even the fact that there's three or 400 people logging in this evening from various parts of the country, various parts of the world, it's just phenomenal. Uh, and, um, how 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 are that wonderful man, uh, the president? Uh, Z, what's the name of it? Oh, why am I? Zawinski. The, the president Zawinski could address the Congress, could address the Canadian Parliament, address the British Parliament. Um, it's just extraordinary from his from his context. God help him in Kiev. Um, it's just a different, a very different reality, and we're going to negotiate it differently. And it, it's the features of it, and they are, are certainly far from obvious. And then you add in all the kind of a conversation about we're living in a secular age. There was a time when faith came by osmosis; it came with the culture. Uh, Charles Taylor, one of the great scholars of our time, picks the year 1500. In the year 1500, uh, it was, it was, faith was just soaked through the whole cultural context and reality. You couldn't grow up and not grow up a Christian. But he says 19, uh, 1500, I would say the Irish village of 1950 that I grew up in, you couldn't possibly have become anything other than a Catholic and a very Irish Catholic at that. Uh, but those days are gone, so that the, the culture no longer encourages faith. In fact, in many ways, it discourages faith. And you can, you can pile on the, the, the different realities that have accosted our contemporary reality, especially by way of faith. I mean, the extraordinary number of young people, it breaks my heart, walking away from this rich, life-giving tradition. Uh, what are we doing? There's something like 40, 40 million people in the United States alone identify themselves as former Catholics. Now, what a tragedy. But on the other hand, what the heck are we doing that's, that's driving so effective at driving people away uh, from this wonderful, rich tradition? Well, it's a different time, and I still see hope for our time, and I don't want to be lamenting the negatives at all, but, but it, it will be a different day. And if we're to negotiate a living faith, a life-giving faith uh, for our time, uh, there'll be lots of adjustments and deepenings and expandings and all kinds of new horizons that we're going to have to live into. So it's going to be a new day. Uh, that then when you come toward Catholic education, it's a brand new day as well. I mean, just look at the religious diversity of the staff and the, and the faculty of our, high, of, our, of our Catholic schools, and not only in this country, but even more so throughout the world. Uh, there was a time when we took for granted the Catholic identity of our schools. Why? Because there were staff with brothers and sisters and, 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 and priests. And 95% of the faculty and staff of Catholic schools in 1965 uh, 90, in the United States, 95% were Catholic, were Catholic uh, less than 3%. Now it's the reverse. Now less than 3% uh, are, 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 are vowed religious, 27 in fact and the rest are all lay people. Now, I believe that any good lay person can provide and offer as fine a Catholic education as any nun, priest, or brother ever did, but they'll have to be prepared for it. 
we'll have to figure out how to go about it. It's, 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 it's a very different reality. Uh, and then the, fa the, the diversity in our student body, a growing number of, 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 of uh, schools, Catholic schools in this country, have a, 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 a significant portion of non-Catholic students, at least 20, 25, 30 percent. But that's only a drop in the bucket compared to other parts of the world. And where Catholic schools are booming in, in Australia, in Canada, uh, and then you, when you go into places like uh, Korea, uh, Pakistan, 90 per, there's a 500 Catholic schools in Pakistan. It's the finest ca educational system in the country. Um, but 90% of their students are, are Muslim, 90% of their faculty are Muslim. And yet, they're giving a very different education to their students than the traditional Muslim schools. Now, I don't want in any way to disparage this traditional Muslim schools, but Benazir Bhutto, Lord rest her soul, the woman, wonderful woman tragically assassinated uh, the prime minister, always claimed that she, she, she learned her, her Muslim faith at Jesus and Mary Convent School in Karachi. And it's fascinating. I'll come back to this at the end of, the, of, the, of, my pres of our conversation. And it will be a conversation more than just me talking. Um, but she, when I asked, when I had the privilege, not of interviewing her, but interviewing somebody who was kind of an alter ego to her, very, very close to her, what was it that she learned at Jesus and Mary Convent School? Well, she learned to be a good Muslim, but she also learned other uh, things that she would not learn in a, in a traditional Muslim school. And again, I don't want to disparage traditional Muslim schools, but the emphasis in Muslim schools is very much in memorization, memorizing, memorizing. Kids can graduate from Muslim schools able to recite the whole Quran. Uh, by rote, uh, whereas she, she graduated indeed with a sense of her Muslim identity, but also a whole different sense of herself as a woman, uh, that she learned a, a different epistemology, a different way of knowing, uh, of looking at data and making decisions and judgments about it, etc. Uh, so it was a different, it prepared her for a whole different way of being in the world, maintaining and nurturing her Muslim identity. Fascinating. Going to Korea. 80% of the students in Catholic schools in Korea, which again are booming and, and, and flourishing, 80% of their student body are not Catholic, 80% of their faculty are not Catholic, and yet they're offering a Catholic education. Now how is a good question and, and, and can we continue that? So that this is a whole, when you stop and think about it, it's a whole new moment for us. There's, and what the significance of our schools have for the life of the world. I mean, there's 50, something like 55,000 Catholic schools from kindergarten to research universities throughout the world in over 200 different countries. And they're, ser they're serving something like 155 million students. So the quality of this educational system is significant. And it's significant not just to our church, but to the life of the world and the kind of contribution we can make to a better world. And I think we have the potential and the possibility of doing that. But it's not inevitable, and it'll have to be terribly deliberate, and we'll have to know what we're doing and why. As Catholic, it'll, we'll have to still be presenting ourselves to the world as Catholic schools. It requires us to educate from a faith perspective. Not, in other words, not just grounded in philosophy and, 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 and uh, social sciences. That can be the give society, uh, philosophy and the social sciences can be very helpful. Uh, to our schools and to the, to the identity of them, but they'll have to be a deeper grounding. They'll have to be grounded in the spirituality, in our spiritual values, in our deep spiritual values. It'll have to arise from there, and it should nurture as much in people's lives. Not that we're going to make Catholics out of, out of all the non-Catholics, or even out of all the Catholics that come, because lots of the Catholics that attend are more cultural Catholics now, probably, than, than confessing ones. But at least we have to open the horizon and propose to people that there is a great transcendent horizon to life, and that it's a great way to live your life, and that it can shape a tremendously positive sense of purpose, of meaning, of ethic, and that this is a great gift to the life of the world, to, to live as if there is indeed this transcendent horizon, as Rahner might call it. Um, and, and we call it God, of course, and God even as revealed uh, the, uh, the God of unconditional love, uh, as revealed in Jesus Christ, is, is, is the God as we know it. But, but however people know their God, whoever, whatever is their higher power, we can encourage them to live into that possibility and that dream. And, and that can be tremendously life-giving. In fact, to live otherwise can be terribly difficult and find meaning and fulfillment. Uh, there are spiritual values that ground it. There's a transcendent horizon to it. I think, it, uh, where does it come from? I think it has to come from the heart. 
from the heart of Catholic faith. Uh, and those values are there. And I, they're universal. Pope Francis keeps you know, emphasizing this. They're not unique or sectarian to us at all. They arise out of our convictions, and I'll say a moment, beginning with Jesus of Nazareth. They arise out of our deep convictions, but they're universal values. They can, en they can improve and enlighten and enhance the life of any person of goodwill and of any society. Pope Francis was asked recently that about all these non-Catholic kids that are coming to Catholic schools and what to do about, what to do about it. In Hong Kong, for example, I spent some time there just before the COVID, and uh, 90, one out of every four students of school age in, in Hong Kong, one out of every four is in a Catholic school. 90% of them are not Catholic. Um, so what, how, how, will, how, will we, what, what, how will we ensure uh, how do these values, or, sorry, I was going to say Pope Francis. Pope Francis said, was asked about it recently. Are we, why are we inviting all these non-Catholic students? He said, welcome them all. And he says, it'll be the one best contribution we can make to the common good of the world. Welcome them all. Well, fine for Pope Francis to say that, but meanwhile, how do you go back and make sure that they're, indeed that we're delivering what we promise? But they can, they, they got values that undergird our educating can enhance the life of any person or society. What does it take? Let me tell you a quick story. Oh, it must be some 30 summers ago now. I was preparing, uh, it was the opening first morning of a summer class, summer institute course here at the School of Theology and Ministry. And um, I was at my desk and uh, people were dribbling in. And this older gentleman came in and he stopped and he looked at me. He says, are you Tom Groom? I said, are you, no, are you the Tom Groom? I said, no, I'm a Tom Groom, okay? Uh, he said, yeah, but he said, uh, uh, I thought you'd be a lot older. I said, well, give me time, you know. <laughs> he said, yeah, but he says, I, I, you've, I've read two of your books. I said, yeah, I said, it's called Getting Tenure at Boston College, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, were you, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, were you ever the principal of a high school? No, no, never the principal of a high school. Huh. I was the principal of a high school for 25 years. They named the high school, the biggest, largest Catholic high school in I think it was Melbourne, but anyhow. Um, I said, okay. Well, it went on, it was very obvious that he was terribly disappointed and was definitely convinced that I didn't have much to tell him or to teach him. So I said, well, look, we don't just stay till the first break. And then if you're not happy, we'd certainly find you another course. There's other two or three other wonderful courses going on at the same time, and you can just switch over. He came up to me at the break time about an hour later, and he says, you know, I think I'll stay. <laughs> he said, because I think I've figured out what I really need to learn. He says, you know, being a principal, I, I, I know how to be a principal, you know, budget and faculty and curriculum, all this. See, I can do that. But he says, you know what I really need to learn now, and you might be able to help me. I need to learn how to be a spiritual leader. And I thought, you've hit the nail on the head. Because he says, we're two old brothers. It was a De La Salle school he was in. He says, we're two old brothers still there, but he says, they're not much, they're not, you know, they're not up to much. They're retired and getting, got old. And in other words, who's going to carry on? Who's going to, who's going to hand on this, this rich legacy? Uh, we stand on wonderful shoulders, but it's our turn. Uh, and it clarified for me that indeed uh, we need, if these schools are to continue as Catholic, uh, at least a, a cadre. Of, of, of faculty and staff, and hopefully a principal or president, uh, that, are good, sir, that are good stewards of this rich legacy. Welcome them all, says Pope Francis. Yeah, good for him, but, but he doesn't have to face the music. <coughs> I'm going to very briefly introduce this section now, and then I'm going to engage you in the conversation. Uh, what I do in the book I, is I, I have three sections. I'm just going to basically review the first section. Um, the, the scriptural basis of Catholic education. And people, when I say that, people often become kind of quizzical. No, it, it, it started with Augustine, didn't it? Or, or Thomas Aquinas, or, or, or uh, Ignatius of Loyola, or, or Benedict, or maybe Julian, or, or somebody like that. I think it started early on. And I think that's where we have to go, to the deep waters, and to the fresh waters. He always, I always love his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. He promised that it always be, be, be fresh water, gushing up, was how Dan Harrington used to translate it, gushing up to eternal life. I think the potential is there for fresh water in this old tradition of ours. Um, 
I want to propose a radical proposal now, and you'll be amazed, I think. I think the heart of Catholic faith should be the heart of Catholic education. And I think the heart of Catholic faith is Jesus the Christ. Now, you wonder why I wrote a book with stuff that's so obvious, and yet I'm going to propose that it's actually a kind of a new idea to us, especially to Catholic education. I'll explain a little of why I think it is. The, Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is a wonderful uh, paragraph in, in 426. Uh, it says there's many aspects to our faith. Of course, creeds, dogmas, doctrines, sacraments, symbols, all kinds, commandments, practices, spiritualities, the whole lot. And yet it says, but at the heart, at the heart we find a person. The person of, and I love how this catechism puts it, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who was indeed the only son from the Father. In other words, the Jesus of history, that carpenter from Nazareth who walked the roads of Galilee, who was also, we believe in our faith, the Christ of faith, the Son of God, the divine presence in human history. God among us is one of ourselves. And I think we have to look to both. We have to look to Jesus, to Christ. The historical Jesus, I think, is a renewed focus for Catholics uh, and for Catholic education. Now, I could digress and give a whole different lecture on why it is somewhat new. Because I think most Catholics, when you talk about Jesus, they say that's the stuff, that's the stuff on Sunday morning about the, the prosperity. It's not that what you're, no, no. Uh, that, that's an antithetical to what I'm talking about. Um, there's a whole catechetical reason that would take me too far afield why I think as Catholics, we were never big on Jesus. Uh, the Christ of faith, the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, uh, that, that indeed uh, was, it was, was dominant and central to our faith. But this carpenter fellow, uh, we didn't near, n attend to him nearly as focused. And there, was there were particular reasons. The Catechism of the Council of Trent, for example, laid out catechesis and shaped catechesis for the next 400 years, from 1665 to 1965. Uh, the Second Vatican Council, but what, 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 what Trent laid out basically was this catechism that people were to follow, and then he gave rise to the Maynooth Catechism, the Baltimore Catechism, the Melbourne Catechism. All the national catechisms were basically taken from the, from the Catechism of the Council of Trent. But the doctrinal the, the, uh, section of Trent was based on the creed. So they took each article of the creed and they catechized it. And that's what happened to you and, your, and my uh, Maynooth Catechism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but remember, in the Apostles' Creed, born of the Virgin Mary, the next article suffered under Pontius Pilate. In other words, we left out his life. Not a word about the life of Jesus. In any of the catechisms that any of you are over 60 years of age, there's only a few of us here that are that elderly, but, but our parents, but it lives on a long time. Our parents and our grandparents were typically unacquainted with Jesus. There isn't a word in the Baltimore Catechism about the miracle of the loaves and fishes or the, the story of the good Samaritan or the prodigal son, the stories he told, the wonderful things he did. Not a word about it. Even there's 11 questions and answers in the Baltimore Catechism on how to gain indulgences. You know, partial indulgences, plenary indulgences. <laughs> Most of you don't think of the word indulgence with that particular connotation. <laughs> but but, but uh, and there's, there's, there's no question on the meaning of Easter. There's one question on Easter is, what is Easter Sunday? And Easter Sunday, it says, Easter Sunday is when Jesus rose from the dead. And then the next question is, you know, you know I don't know, whatever it is, but nothing at all about the meaning of it, the potential of it, the possibility of it for our lives. And I think, and then of course, we had a, limited, we had a very limited uh, lectionary selection, a one-year selection. And in many old cultures, the, the, the gospel was actually read in Latin, and then the sermon was given on a section of the Catechism of Trent. And the Catechism of Trent in many old cultures, Irish culture included, Hispanic culture, was preached over a three-year cycle, not the gospel of the Sunday. Now we've done better since Vatican II, and we now have a three-year cycle of readings, and we're reading our Bible, not like our Protestant brothers and sisters uh, do, but we're doing a little better than we used to, because before that, it was a kind of a Protestant book. You wouldn't want to be reading it at all. You'd read your catechism. So I think that, that now all of that is gone, and thank God for Vatican II, et cetera, et cetera. But the old ways live on, and, and I think there is a sense in which uh, the historical Jesus, we're, we're in for a renewal with the historical Jesus. And it's interesting, and Tom would tell us this, uh, all, most of the great New Testament scholarship going on now around Jesus 
uh, Myers and, and uh, Crossan and all the rest of them are, are Irish. Are, no, they're not Irish. They're, they're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> John Dominic Crossan is, but, but uh, uh, they're Catholic. So it's a kind of, it's our turn to find and encounter this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth. And above all, he was a teacher. Uh, he was an educator. Uh, he's referred to as teaching over a hundred times in the, script, in, the, in the four Gospels. So he's eminently a teacher. Let me bring you into the conversation. All right. It took me too long to get here, but I'm, we'll, we'll move along now. When you stop and think about it, and we're going to invite you to have a chat with a neighbor for a couple of minutes about this, and just share your thoughts. thoughts. And the people at home or watching on the video, um, on the Zoom, uh, they can put, put their questions, as, as uh, Megan said, into the chat room, and James will alert me to what, uh, not just questions, but comments. Just not what do you, your own insights and your own wisdom is, what is, is, is equally welcome. What do you re readily recognize as the deep values of Jesus? Like, what do you think was at the heart and soul of his passion and commitment that he presented to the world? What was central? Think about that for a moment and see what occurs to you. Well, let me, let me, oh, you have two more questions coming. Sorry, I misled you. You have two more questions. You have two more, two more questions. Yeah, yeah. Right now. But that's great. I love the fact you're turning to a neighbor. Uh, uh, and if you don't feel like talking to the neighbor, don't. Uh, but the neighbor will have something to say. They always, the neighbor will always have something to say. So how, so when you think about the values of Jesus, how might those values shape Catholic education? So when you took those values and put them to work in a Catholic school, what would they suggest? And let me give you the third question now that you're ready to talk. How would the values of Jesus shape your own vocation? Because you're all educators. That great commission on a hillside in Galilee, everybody present was given it to go forth and to evangelize and to teach. So by baptism, we're all responsible uh, to hand on this faith of ours. So all of us are Catholic educators in some way, shape, or form, parenting, grandparenting, classrooms, wherever. So when you take the values of the historical Jesus and recognize what they were, what would this suggest for your own responsibility as a Catholic educator? Give that a thought, 10 seconds, and we'll move to conversation. All right, go to work. Give yourself four or five minutes. We'll, we'll hear your wisdom, and then we'll regather. We'd love to hear just a sample, just two or three comments. <clears throat> Would there be more time? But we'd love to hear two or three, four comments, something that occurred to you that you should share with the rest of us as you think about it. Um, and uh, James, if there's good wisdom coming in from the people uh, online, we'll be happy to hear that as well. Will you tell me or do I get it up here? You'll tell me, okay. Well, let's start at home here. Uh, somebody give us a bit of wisdom. Yourself. Yeah, he emanated love. He emanated love. Oh, that's right. We Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's a good one. It should be recorded. Yes. Thank you, sir. Again. Maybe. Sir. I think uh, the essence of Jesus. He always emanated love and, and drew love out of people. Indeed. Indeed. Well said. Friend here. Hi, Megan Hi, how are you? So I really enjoy the teachings of Sinclair Ferguson, and he likes to discuss legalism and antinomo, <laughs> as I could discuss with my neighbor, but it's hard when you're nervous. Antinomal, antinomalism. Antinomalism, and okay. Yeah, and that is. Uh, Either legalism is you stick to God's law, and antinomianism is when you break God's law. So he looks at uh, the story of the Garden of Eden, and when he discusses the discussion between the serpent and Eve, he says that this uh, has a different viewpoint. We cannot okay. just look at the serpent as saying, well, please eat this fruit. The serpent is actually telling Eve, God left the fruit on this tree for you to eat. 
Okay, so, so that's a different interpretation of of the of the garden. Yes, yeah, thank you. And Th I thank you so think much. As modern times, it's nice for young people to think you could break God's law to learn God's law. Fair enough. Well said. Your, another thought or comment. I think the deep values of Jesus are revealed in the Beatitudes. Beatitudes, yeah. yeah it's the, right at the beginning of the Sermon of the, on the Mount, and you mentioned Dan Harrington, he used to refer to the Sermon on the Mount as the State of the Kingdom Address. Yeah, State well of the thought. Kingdom, it's lovely, lovely, yeah. Now you won't do better than the Beatitudes, which of course then I think are echoed in Matthew 25 as how we will be judged. Uh, one more from somebody, yourself, Barbara. And James, if there's a word we should hear from the, from the hinterland, you can tell us next. Um, one of the things, one of the many things that Jesus taught, I think, is that he's human. He's human. That he's human. Yes. And I think many, many people really don't cross that bridge. Yeah. And consequently, don't believe that Jesus understands how they feel. Yeah. Whether it's delight or fear or just being down. And I think Jesus really gives us a, a window into we're made human. And that's what it means to be holy. And so. how we need to be human. Yeah, indeed. Well, Colleen and I have been working a wonderful, uh, watching a wonderful series, this day, The Chosen. Uh, it's a powerful presentation of how it brings home to you the reality of his, of his humanity uh, and the locatedness of it and his cultural context and so on. Let me push on a little bit. Uh, James, is there some a word we should hear from the hinterland? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of great comments here, but one very strong trend that people have brought up is the idea of a radical inclusion of, of all inclusion. kinds of people. Yes, yes, absolutely. Powerful. Uh, the inclusivity and, and is welcoming of all, and especially sinners and uh, undesirables. Yeah, very radical. Let me push on a little bit um, and make a few proposals, then I'm going to give this back to you. Um, I'm going to outline five features, and this is not exhaustive at all, it's just, very, just simply barely skimming the, the surface and suggestive. Um, I think the scholars agree, and, and by the way, when we talk about the historical Jesus, I'm, I'm well aware of the, ancient, the old quest for the historical Jesus going back to the 18th century and Schweitzer's great book of 19... 06, I believe it was, the quest for the historical Jesus. Can we really know reliably who this, historic, who this historical figure was? And uh, or was a lot of it written in, in and copied? So did he ever really say, you know, uh, what, what do we see? Uh, I came not to bring peace, but the sword. Did he ever really say that? Or was it a controversy that was going on in Matthew's community at the time? And Matthew uh, put it in to let people know that even Jesus expected us to be fighting over, over this or something like that. Or was it, but, but I think that I follow uh, Jose Pagola, one of the finest New Testament scholars, I think, of our time, who says that with all of our critical scholarship, we can at least approximate. We can come to an approximate. A, a reliable, because we're depending upon the, those, those original communities who knew Jesus personally and the, the different uh, oral traditions that grew up around them and then the pericopes of writing that began to emerge and eventually coalesce into the four Gospels, etc. But these were people who, who gave their lives to it and many, many of them gave their lives for it in witness to him. And that, that yeah, we can't say, yeah, he definitely said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth or whatever it is. Um, but we, in general, it's very difficult to say that the reign of God was not the core theme of his preaching, at least in the three synoptics. And then in John's gospel, of course, it's, 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 not, it's not so much parables that he engages people by, but rather by analogies and metaphors. The they, uh, verse before the gospel in today's common lectionary is, you know, I am the light of the world. Those who walk with me or who follow me will live with the, in the light of life will have the light of life. So there's meta more metaphorical and analogy and what have you that he uses in John. And yet there, it's deeply engaging of people's lives and, and, and yet proposing this extraordinary vision uh, to be lived into. So, uh, and certainly for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the synoptics, we can say that the, the core theme was his notion, this notion of the reign of God. An extraordinary utopian vision 
Uh, and in John, he calls it having life to the full. God's vision for us, the vision of shalom, the best of everything for every person, society, for all of God's creation, uh, values of love and compassion, justice and peace, mercy and kindness, all the longings of the human heart. I often think of Yeats's wonderful poem, The Land of Heart's Desire. It's a wonderful description of the reign of God the land of heart's desire, all the deepest longings and passions and hungers of our hearts. Uh, that's what he meant by the reign of God. And that this is God's will for us. This is God's desire for us. And that we're to be working toward it as agents of God's, of God's will. Um, for a Catholic education, uh, it invites us to commit students to works for the reign of God and to do this on earth as it's been done in heaven. And with a special emphasis on daily bread and forgiving debts, all kinds of radical ideas. Encourage them to live into this transcendent horizon, that there is this wonderful meaning and purpose and, uh, to life and, and an ethic. We call it God, but as I said, we can call by, by whatever name people prefer, whatever the, however they name their higher power. But for Jesus, it's this wonderful possibility. It's this wonderful ultimate possibility that is, is the horizon for all of us. It prepares them to live lives of faith. We, we prepare them to live lives of faith, hope, and love. And I love how the fact that he often emphasized that building this reign of God, yeah, it's daunting, isn't it? But you know what? Little things matter. Uh, a pinch, a pinch of yeast can make the whole dough rise. Uh, the widow's might can be the most important contribution. Uh, you know, planting a little seed hey, can become a heck of a big mustard, mustard tree, etc., etc. So that it's not doing the outlandish and the grandiose. It can be the ordinary and the everyday. That we, that we contribute and build up the reign of God. Uh, the woman baking the bread, as I said, a pinch of yeast would make it all to rise. A second feature of him, he saw tremendous potential. I, I'm picking the features that would be significant for education. He saw tremendous potential in the human person. Tom, Tom mentioned it already. He called us to live this greatest commandment. Uh, now, the Beatitudes unpack it and how we're to go about it. Uh, to love God by loving neighbors as ourselves, even enemies. And, and ultimately, of course, in the great last discourse in John's Gospel, he basically tells us that we're called to love as our God loves. That's the new commandment. The new commandment, is the great commandment, the greatest commandment, love the neighbor, love God, love your neighbor, love your, as yourself. And all three are, are imperative, love God, neighbor, and self, even enemies. But then in John, in the, last, in the last discourse, he talks about it as if we're to love as God loves. He says, as I have loved you, so as, I have, uh, as God has loved me, I have loved you, live on in my love. So as God loves Jesus, Jesus loves us, and we're to live on in the same love. It's like uh, this outlandish horizon for us. And yet what tremendous possibility and what tremendous confidence he had in the potential we have as human beings to truly live this greatest commandment and this new commandment. An extraordinary potential. Um, and of course, no better way to live. Imagine him saying to poor peasant people, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Uh, talk about affirming people. Uh, to those he helped and healed so often, he says, your faith, your faith cured you. He never says, I cured you. Never. Ah, uh, constantly says to people, the blind Bartimaeus, the one I refer here is the woman, which is one of my favorites, the woman who had been bleeding uh, for 12 years. And she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And when he becomes aware of it, he talks, turns around and says, daughter. He addresses her as a daughter of Abraham and Sarah, as, a, as one of the family. And he says, your faith, your faith has healed you. Never says, I, I healed you. Does it over and over to the leper who came back to give thanks. He says, your faith, the blind Bartimaeus, your faith healed you. Talk about affirming people and saying, you've got fantastic potential. You've got enormous possibility. You're made in the image and likeness of God. That's why. Uh, so it's limitless what, what you can do. Uh, it's extraordinary. Talk about affirming their agency. What would it mean for Catholic education? Of course, it would ask us, we'd have to recognize and nurture the gifts of every person, of every student, empowering their potential, to encourage them, however they're, they're abled or differently abled, that they can excel, they can be their best selves. Uh, it would engage all as agents of their own knowing, 
Uh, in other words, that, that as Yates again would put it, that education is not about filling a bucket, it's about lighting a fire. Well, my goodness, if anybody was to light a fire, it would be this, the, the, the fire that Jesus would encourage. It, it, it's getting people to think for themselves, to be agents of their own knowing. Uh, my friend and mentor in li a great deal of my life was uh, the great Paolo Freire. I was privileged to, to know Freire, to taught with him, co-taught with him here twice at Boston College. Some of you may even remember, and I've taken some of those courses. Uh, but Freire says that the worst the thing in the world is banking education. Uh, education it just takes information and deposits it in passive receptacles. And then you ask them, oh, what did I say? And if they tell you accurately what you said, then you need to get an A. Uh, Feely just depositing passive. He says it's treating people as, as, as just receptacles or something. It's the antithesis. But the gospel of Jesus would say the same. To, to talk, I encourage them to think, to query, to question. He'd often turn people's worlds upside down. How often, you know, that the Samaritan uh, turns out to be the neighbor, uh, and the prodigal is welcomed home, and, and Lazarus goes home to God, and, and the rich man to Hades or whatever. I mean, you could pile up the examples of how he, he turned people's world upside, gotten them to think for themselves, to stand back and to look at and to reflect and to wonder. There are over 300 different times, a scripture scholar who counted, uh, he asked them questions. And are, are, are often not just straightforward questions, but, po but questioning activities. Like he'd throw out a, you know, the, the, uh, you know, look at the birds of the air. You, know, you can imagine people looking at the birds of the air. They, they neither reap nor sow nor gather into barns. So now you get, they're getting people to think. They don't reap or sow or gather into barns. And yet, your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father feeds them. The, 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 the gospel, his, 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 his preaching, his teaching, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then the question, aren't you of more value than, than sparrows? People go, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we probably are, you know, yeah. But that was classic to how he taught. Uh, constantly engaging people's own life. Like the parable, the reign of God is like, reign of God is like people, you know, man hiring workers in the morning, people uh, sorting fish down at the lake shore, uh, woman baking bread or whatever it is. But you can imagine people thinking, I always imagine them, you know, that parable of, of the reign of God is like people sorting fish. I bet he was down at the lake shore. And people would begin talking about, and one of the big topics of the time apparently was the reign of God. What do we mean by it? And there were people talking about it. And I bet I used to love say, you know what I think the reign of God is like? I, I think it's a lot like people sorting fish. They imagine them saying, sorting fish, geez, really, what, we, what we're doing is the reign of God. Yeah, yeah. Because you're, you're throwing in the little ones, you know, to grow. And the, the, the dead ones you give to the birds. The good ones you take off to market. And you can imagine people saying, is he saying there's going to be a judgment? There's going to be a, a, a test? There's going to, that we're not inevitably members of this reign of God just by birth or something? I mean, he was turning people's world upside down, getting them to think for themselves and to see for themselves. And of course, often said, blessed are the eyes that, the eyes that, that see and blessed are the ears that hear. He obviously wasn't talking about physical sight and hearing. He's talking about people who could recognize and see for themselves. That type of education is what should mark our Catholic schools, not fitting them into society, but getting them ready to turn it upside down. Uh, and educate them all, us all to become fully alive, as Irenaeus would put it, to the glory of God. Let me move on. Tremendous deep compassion and justice for all. Now, hands up how many of you thought about that when I asked my first question. Deep compassion, everybody. It's how we associate with it, this tremendous compassion. Jesus worked miracles. Went around, walked the roads of Galilee, you know, feeding, feeding hungry people, healing sick people, consoling bereaved people, driving out evil, restoring people to dignity from their, from their social shame. There's only two miracles reported or recorded six times in the four Gospels. Two miracles re reported six times. The miracle of the resurrection and the miracle of the loaves and fishes. It's, it's, it's in all four synoptics, and then twice in Matthew, twice in Mark. In other words, it must have been feeding hungry people must have been a central aspect of his public ministry. Uh, why else would it be, would it, now the de details alter a little, 4,000, 5,000, four fish, seven fish, who cares? Uh, it was obviously a central passion of his life to feed hungry people. And you can go on and on about it, which I could. 
Uh, he claimed to fulfill Isaiah 61. Walter Brueggemann, again a great scholar we teach here many times over the summers, uh, Walter always said that this was, this was the, he was looking, when he went into that synagogue on a Sabbath day uh, at, at hometown of Nazareth, that it says that he, he, looked, he, he found the text. Now, my Greek is a bit uh, rusty, but the verb there is hurisco. And Tom, I think hurisco can mean to find something, but I think it also means to look for something. So in other words, he, he probably looked for the text of Isaiah 61, verse 1, and there's an echo of 58, verse 7 as well. But, but Brighamon always said he was looking for the most radical text he could possibly find in the Hebrew Scriptures. And then he said, the Spirit of God is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim God's year of jubilee. And then closed the text and said, this day, this text is fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, and all the eyes of the people in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. I think that's what we have to do as well when it comes to Catholic education. Uh, the values that he had. Of this, he calls it this tremendously public faith. Disciples will be judged by whether we saw. Tom's comment about the Beatitudes. Did, uh, but the, the, Matthew 25. And isn't it interesting? God will not say to us, you know, there was a hungry person one time and you fed them. But God will say, I was hungry. You gave me to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me to drink, etc., etc. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Uh, I was in the Ukraine and you helped, you sent help, or whatever it might be. Um, how we will be judged. And the difference, the difference between the goats and the, and the sheep, the only difference is neither one of them saw God or saw Jesus. They both say, hey, when, when did we see you? We never saw you. The only difference between them is that the sheep saw the poor and the suffering, whereas the goats didn't even see them. The, sh the sheep saw them and responded. The goat saw them probably, but didn't respond to them. Because they said, we never saw, we never saw. So the only difference between our go the goats and the sheep is whether or not we see uh, and see the ones that need to be seen. For Catholic Ed, we nurture a critical social consciousness that acts towards the reign of God in human history with deep compassion for the poor, justice for all, care for creation. Uh, we would have to engage and favor all of our students, especially the poor. Students, I remember years ago when the uh, option for the poor had become kind of common language, I given a workshop in a, in a, in a, in a school, Catholic high school, and a student or a faculty person came up to me after and said, Tom, you know, all the students in our school are, are wealthy, so how do we make an option for the poor? So I said to him, don't you have some poor students? In other words, students that are struggling, students that are behind, students that need a bit of extra help, hey, give it to them, you're supposed to. Uh, this option for the poor. I always love the story of him reaching out to the woman and it's in Luke 13 that was bent over for 18 years. Imagine, she saw nothing but people's feet for 18 years. Because the, the text says she was, it implies that she was totally bent over. But he goes over and he takes the initiative because she probably didn't even know he was there. And he takes her and raises her up. Can't you imagine it? And the amazement and, and uh, touching her would have made him unclean and so on. But talk about his option for the poor and his, his siding with her and, and the poorest person he probably could possibly find in that society, this woman who was totally bent over. And yet he takes the initiative and raises her up. Uh, just extraordinary. Number one, it would, it, would, it would certainly, if we follow this Jesus fellow, he would, we would have to welcome all. Uh, we'd have to be truly Catholic. In the, in, the, in the sense of inclusive. Uh, he was radically inclusive. I know especially his table fellowship. His outreach was to the rich, the poor, the young, the old, the saints, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. I often think, it like, it, and I'm not a great scripture scholar, but in Mark, about 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 21 or so, they begin to complain about who he's eating with. And about 8 or 12 verses later, the beginning of Matthew 3, they begin to plot to kill him. And I often think there was a cor some correlation, at least. Why did they start getting angry with him from the beginning? And Mark, I always take as the most historical of the four accounts. Uh, why did they start getting angry with him so soon? I think it was, my sense is always that because of the people he was eating with, because the people he was bringing to the table. And in that world at that time, to bring people to the table was very radical. The most amazing thing of all was his full inclusion of women uh, among his core group of disciples. Luke 8, 1 to 3 says that names these women 
that were that were that were that were that were members of his inner core of, of community of disciples. The women at the foot of the cross, uh, Mark, are the women are the only ones there. The men have all run away. But um, it, it notes in all three synoptics that they had come up from Galilee with them. That these women, who were his co members of his core group, had come up from Galilee. Which, if you take John's chronology, they could have been with him for as much as three years, uh, as part of his inner circle. They were the first witnesses to the resurrection. Of course, you know a lot of this already. Uh, welcoming, G, welcoming children was radical, as if they're in charge of the reign of God. In the world of the time, children didn't even have the status of property in Roman law. They were just like chattel. Uh, and yet he says, no, let these little children come to me, and you better, you better people, big people might become a lot more childlike if you want to get, be members of my reign of God. Extraordinary stuff. For the Catholic school to be truly Catholic community, we're welcoming all and everybody fully included. It's so embarrassing when our church or our schools in any way, shape, or form uh, discriminate against any person, uh, be it for color, uh, for sexual orientation, uh, for, for economic status, uh, or whatever it is. We should be totally free of the, the, any trace or semblance of exclusion or condemnation of people. If we're to be faithful to this Jesus, uh, we couldn't possibly do otherwise. Um, if they're not welcome and fully included, then it's not a Catholic school. It's as simple as that. Uh, to respect and promote the dignity of every person. Uh, all is cherished. All is as, as, uh, as greatly valued. Uh, and then I'll have the, add the hope of Easter. I'm just going to leave the historical Jesus because I don't want to close out without saying something about, indeed, as Yeats again would put it, all changed, was changed utterly. And a terrible beauty was born with this Easter, with this empty tomb. Not that we believe in an empty tomb, but we, we believe in the risen Christ. And there's hope forever because of Easter. We should be people of tremendous hope. And, and our educating, our schools should be places of tremendous hope for people and holding out hope for people. Uh, this Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Christ of faith whom God raised up and therefore our faith is not in vain. He was God among us as one of ourselves, incarnated God's unconditional love and modeled who we can become as well. His life, death and resurrection overcame sin and evil. You know all this already. Personal and social affecting our liberating salvation as Pope, uh, Pope uh, uh, Paul VI used to call it. I love that language. Liberating salvation. It's the best of the liberation theology and the old traditional salvation theology, all from oppression, even from the oppression ultimately of death. For Catholic Ed, I think it's one of the most, the greatest gifts we can give to our young people, the gift of hope, and that there's always hope, and that we're never without hope, because we do believe that this that God raised up this Jesus, and that, that, this, that this extraordinary Paschal event, as we call it, released what Paul ref re refers to constantly as an abundance of God's grace, an abundance of God's grace into human history. Uh, that, and what is this grace? It's simply God's effective love at work in the world. It's God's effective love at work. Uh, and this is, this, is what our, this, is what, this is our Easter faith, uh, that there's always hope. Uh, there's no tyranny that can prevail. And I know even as we, as we pain and suffer and cringe and, and worry and pray for our, our, the poor people of, of uh, Ukraine, yet we know that ultimately uh, it won't prevail. There'll be a lot of suffering and death and destruction perhaps in the meantime. But, but the good has to win out. Uh, there's no lies that can ever become true. There's no addiction that's beyond recovery. Uh, because of this risen Christ and this nature grace debate that's so, or a partnership rather, that's so central to our Catholic faith, that this nature and grace, and I think the people who know this best, the people I know who know this best, are people in recovery programs uh, who will tell you that it's a heck of a struggle to stay dry and you can't take a job in a bar and you'd be very careful of the company you keep, etc. It's a real struggle uh, to fight an addiction to alcohol or whatever it might be, and yet you do it with the help of higher power. And they'll tell you that. The ones in recovery will always say, we do it with the help of God, however they name their God. It's a powerful witness. And I think it's so core to our Catholic theology in general. I think it's so core to the understanding of Jesus 
that, it, that, that this grace is always available. So that to, to give young people that sense of hope as they sally forth into the world, daunted at times by the challenges that are there, and yet they need not, uh, they need not despair. There'll always be hope for them. Okay, it's taken me too long to get here, but let me bring you back into the conversation, and then we'll, we'll wind down shortly. I had a whole other section that we'll have to keep it for another time. What new wisdom might you learn from Jesus the teacher? So just from my ramblings thus far, what do you think occurs to you uh, that might inspire whatever your work, your ministry, parenting, whatever it is, what do you want to learn again and renew again and embrace again from this Jesus the teacher in your own context, your own life? Just recognize that for a moment. What new horizon uh, might remembering Jesus invite for all Catholic education, wherever it takes place? Okay, let's give two or three minutes back with the neighbor, have a little chat, tell the neighbor what you're thinking. And uh, yeah, we'll just do about three minutes because I rambled too long here. Uh, and I do want to do one more little section before we go. Um, have a chat with the neighbor and tell, give them your best wisdom, would you please? Thank you. We'll come back and regather. Sorry about that. I, I just went on too long. I, I meant to get here sooner. Um, give us some of the wisdom that was emerging among you and the thoughts you were having. And maybe, James, you could give us a word from the hinterland as well. Somebody give us a word yourself. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> oh, that's right. We've got to wait for the microphone. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom. I am Tom Ryan. I'm, uh, Principal at Cristo Ray Boston. <coughs> I say this, I just want to thank Boston College for all that they do for and with Cristo Ray. Um, every, I feel like every department on campus is, a, is active at Cristo Ray Boston, so just thank you for everything um, that, that is done, yeah. that you do for and with, so yeah. really appreciate that. Um, but that Cristo kind of, Ray is a great example yeah. of great Catholic education. And, and uh, what it got me thinking about <coughs> this was just the the collaboration that exists um, amongst the different Catholic organizations. And you know, having been in my entire career in a Catholic high school education, um, you know, working at other schools where you know, winning the state title was essential and winning and coming to Cristo Rey, where during the pandemic it was, um, I reached out to a number of different Catholic schools, organizations, just said, we need your help. And that um, and how many responded, and just that it's okay to ask for help from our fellow organizations, Wonderful. and everybody, you know, you know, BC was a big major player in that. Yeah. Um, and just how important it is to those vulnerable moments of of asking for help, and then um, both, it. you know, with fellow faculty from, but also to the great organization. Thank you, and bless your good work, Tom. Yeah, Crystal Ray, the wonderful. Wonderful school system. Yourself. <coughs> and James, maybe we'll take a comment from the chat then. <coughs> Pardon me. We were four people in our group, and we have four words. One was extending hospitality. You know, this is a kind of a newer horizon that uh, Jesus is constantly inviting us to. Hospitality. The second, um, extent, uh, remaining in proximity to those who are excluded. Okay. The third was uh, inclusion of those who are normally include, uh, uh, excluded. And lastly, forgiveness and restoration Lovely. of people. Wonderful list. We, it's hard to improve on those. You couldn't. Wonderful. Thank you. And one last one, Marianne, and then we'll have a word from James. <clears throat> I think Jesus knew his need for God. He knew it and felt it deeply. And um, as a result, um, he spent so much of his energy in prayer and then um, refurbishing the energy that was taken in all the ministry. But I think without the prayer, without the intense 
union with God, with the Holy Spirit, yes. where he got all of his creative ideas yeah. and his courage. Um, I think we need to yeah. foster that in our schools and, and invite people into a practice, a practice. of prayer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's something like 30 different times <clears throat> there's, a, right, there's some mention of him going aside, stay uh, for prayer. So obviously his life was grounded in a life of prayer. He couldn't have maintained the, the commitments he had without it. James, you want to give us a word from, the, from our, our friends at home? Sure. Um, <clears throat> again, there, there are many uh, great comments here. Also, again, there is a, a trend of people identifying uh, inclusion as an important thing that they're taking away here. But also, um, there seems, if I were to uh, sort of summarize and paraphrase, I think people see Jesus as offering hope in that he provides a kind of vision that can break through sort of ossification in systems and let love come into the relationships and the education that's taking place there. Fantastic. Well done. Well done. Great summary. Let me push on just a little bit further. Uh, I'm going to skip. Uh, I, too, I have too much prepared. It, it did begin at that hillside in Galilee. Um, there's this, this commission. And what I do in the next section of the book, part two takes up some of the great exponents over history uh, of Catholic education. I'll just summarize this very briefly. Um, the, the, intellectual the Catholic intellectual tradition that began in many ways with the Didache. Uh, when you come away from the Gospels, one of the first earliest documents we have. And it may be, uh, some scholars would say that some parts of the Didache could have been from the first century. But I, I pick up the Didache and I come down to, uh, to, the, to John Baptist de la Salle and, and uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton and people like that. And the, the great, some of the great uh, exponents along across the last 2,000 years of the Catholic intellectual tradition and what it, means, what it would mean for Catholic education today. And some of the obvious people, Augustine and Aquinas and Benedict, but also Julian uh, of Norwich and, and uh, uh, Angela de Merici, Mary Ward, uh, some of the great women is, uh, that, that have carried this, this great tradition over, its, especially its educating uh, across the centuries. And then in the, in the third section, I try to lay out some of contemporary Catholic theology, our anthropology, our sociology, our epistemology, and what it would mean for, for Catholic education. So that, that, that's a pleasure that awaits you if you, if you uh, choose. <laughs> um, what I want to do is, is that, that, I want to summarize this very quickly, that when that first community, you know, he, he said go and teach, go, go evangelize, uh, go baptize people into the very inner life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach. And a controversy broke out after a couple of, uh, well, fairly early in the, in, the, in the early centuries about was the church to be involved in teaching? Was it to be involved in education, I should say? It was definitely to teach the gospel. It was to evangelize people. But, but should it get involved in, like, in education, in running schools? And there were lots of good people who said, no. We have the word of God uh, revealed and the fullness of it in, the, in, in, in Jesus of, of Nazareth. Uh, why do we need to turn to philosophy and, and uh, the secular subjects? And there's a danger there. Some of their values, some of their morals are not the same as ours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and yet, wiser voices prevailed. One of them was Clement of Alexandria, and I always love his, how he put it. He said, education can be a work of salvation. In other words, it's a way of saving souls to give people a good education. And he was pushing back against Tertullian, who was saying that Jerusalem is no need of Athens. We don't need, we, we have it all in, in the word of God. So why do, we, how do we have to go to these Greek philosophers and poets and all these kind of people? But the wiser voices prevailed. And a great part of the controversy was, could there be a, 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 could there be a partnership um, between faith and reason? And Clement argued that it was his own philosophical background that in fact had brought him to faith, that enabled him to see the coherence and the consistency and the compelling nature of, of Christian faith. And it had been his philosophy that prepared him to recognize that, that this could be, or as, as Origen put it, that this, these secular subjects could be stirrups to reach the sky of divine revelation and so on. So the, the church gradually began to, to, to realize that our faith has to be a public faith. 
and we have to bring it out into the into the, the, stra the stratas of society. And one of the things we're to do there is to educate and to run schools. And then, of course, hospitals and dispensaries as well. But it, it explains, we as, as Catholics, we say, I kind of think this is for granted. Uh, because there's lots of other good Christian traditions that don't have nearly the same emphasis on sponsoring schools as we have. We think it's integral to the mission of the church and the world to do good, ordinary, everyday education, reading, writing, arithmetic, and rhetoric. Um, uh, there's lots of good Christian traditions that, that don't embrace that, or that the hospitals we run, or the social services we run. Now, they do wonderful work as well. I'm not disparaging anybody, but, but it, it, we kind of take it for granted. But it was a huge controversy, and the breakthrough was when they thought that yeah, re, faith and reason could be partners, because then it led on to all kinds of other partnerships, uh, of science and revelation, of knowledge and wisdom, of ideas and values, of ac strong academics and ethical formation. And in many ways, those partnerships remained in place until the Reformation. Now, I don't want to blame poor old Luther for it, because he gets blamed for too much already. But he realized that if his Reformation was to succeed, that he would have to take education out of the hands of the church and the monasteries and so on and put it into the hands of the governments. And so he appealed 15, 20, 21. He wrote this famous letter to the princes of Germany saying, you must found schools. You must begin a, a schooling system that replaces these dreadful monastic schools where our children are being corrupted with all kinds of, of terrible ideas, etc." cetera. Uh, so we've got to get rid of these monastic schools and have, have government schools. Et now he still insisted there were to be Christian schools with these Christian values and so on, but guess what? Indeed, the, the Prussian educational system became the, the great model of public education in the, West, in the Western world. Uh, and uh, it placed education in the hands of the civil powers. And, and, and that was fine for a while, but those old partnerships were lost. Now, I don't want in any way to disparage public education and so on. It does wonderful work, and it's, it's a tremendous uh, resource to our society, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm rather trying to raise up still what it remains distinctive about Catholic education rather than, to, rather than to critique public education. Because instead of the partnership of faith and reason, after the Enlightenment and, and Descartes looking for sure and certain ideas and, and so on and so forth, uh, the, the, the Luther's plea to the German princes to keep these schools eminently Christian was soon forgotten. And they simply became public agents of education without any basis in faith. Uh, without the revelation, it was science alone, not revelation and science, wisdom, uh, knowledge alone, uh, ideas alone, uh, academics alone, the formation was gone. And, and you might say, well, yeah, what's, the, what's, the, what's the loss there? Well, just think of those part, that partnership, for example, of science and revelation. Can we do both? Can we do both in our schools? Can we go into our science classes and teach cosmogenesis? And that the world began in creation in 14 or 15, or maybe now a billion years ago with a big bang and so on. Now we can get the students to think about it. Why was there a big bang rather than a great silence? But, but, and so we can do work there. But, but and then can we go into our religion class and teach them the, the, the Genesis chapter 1, that the, the six days and the seventh day God rested? Can we do both? Of course we can. There are different ways of knowing. One is scientific and, and et cetera. One of the other is metaphorical and allegorical or whatever way we want to describe it. But they're both powerful ways of knowing. And that, that revelation, that, that Genesis chapter 1, lends meaning and purpose to the, the cosmogenesis story. They would never have others because it says, and you know what? God made them male and female in God's image and likeness. And God put them in charge of creation uh, and to care for creation. Now, you don't get that from cosmogenesis, but you will get it from, from Genesis chapter 1, and on and on and on, so that the partnerships were lost. And one of the great, the, one, the, the biggest partnership lost was that of moral, of moral and spiritual formation. And most of our public, at least, schools in this part of the world do very little by way of moral or, or spiritual formation. Uh, they turn out lots of very fine people and good people, etc. cetera. I'd never imply or, or otherwise. But it's not a deliberate, integral aspect of the curriculum, where it's supposed to be for us. Uh, I think it's still one of the best reasons we have for Catholic education. Let me skip the rest, and, and you can only imagine what it was all about. It. The, I'm, what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to hear, I'm trying to turn about, or let me just go up here a little bit. Uh, I'll do this very quickly. What do we do about religious education in these schools? Because we don't want to proselytize or impose our faith 
And yet, young people are flocking to our schools that are from other traditions, and for very little tradition, or maybe uh, just a cultural Catholic tradition. I think there's a way to do it. And you know what? I'm going to propose that Jesus' pedagogy could be suggestive. Um, and I, I think I'm just going to have to leave it at that, because his pedagogy is fascinating, how he engaged people's lives and got them to think for themselves, and yet proclaimed the gospel, and yet left them free to choose whether to follow or not, and to discern if that's what they wanted to do. So I'll have to leave that. The religious education piece does, is, it is a particular, um, a particular challenge. I think we can teach a tradition in either of three ways. That people learn about it, they learn from it, or they learn into it. And I think we can do the latter two in our Catholic schools. Not just that they learn about it, but that they learn from it and learn into it as well. It's in chapter 10 of the book if you want to take a look at it. Um, I'm skipping all of this because I just wanted the closing reflection. Well, let me end with this. Okay. There's an ebb to every tide except the tide of God's grace. It's an old Irish uh, wisdom saying, every tide rises or, fall, rises or falls, but not, uh, not God's grace. When you go home, or while you're at home, what's the one thing you'd love to tell somebody about tonight's uh, somewhat garbled presentation? What's the one thing you would share with a friend from what we've been talking about all evening? Give us a couple of examples. It's up to me. It's up to me. Fair enough. Another? I'm blessed to be a teacher. I'm blessed to be a teacher. That's a lovely one. Yeah? There's no better vocation. It's important to know who Jesus is. It is important to get to know Jesus, definitely. Yeah, Tom, last word. Education. <laughs> Education is about the heart more than the head. It is, yeah, oh, yeah, it is. We, live, we need both, but the, and the heart has been left out in large part. Uh, but we can't do good Catholic education without it. Look at, uh, as Tom implied earlier in the evening, I'm off to a flight to, uh, to uh, Washington, D.C., and to a St. Patrick's Day party at the White House tomorrow as a guest of Mr. and Mrs. Biden. So I'm bragging and boasting now, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, so that's why I'm a bit overdressed for the occasion. But on the vigil of the feast, I figured we could, we could get away with it. But thank you so much for coming. I've had a great time with you, and blessings to everybody.